There's a there's a guy in Wales, Bob Sherman, World War II vet, the 101st Airborne. He still can drive. He, he, yeah, he still remembers the serial number on his key now. <laughs> Well, I'll just show you how sharp his mind is at 97. Yeah. How are you, kiddo? Good, good. Good. Excellent. Good. I did. <laughs> Who's that guy? Dan Dillon. Oh, who's that guy? He's hiding. 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 Well, the basement, you know, and after we just had the rain pour, it was pouring. That's good. We need it. Yeah, we do. At my first club bass fishing tournament Saturday. My golf league starts in two two weeks from yesterday. It's spring. Yes. Yeah. I planted bees on what day did I plant bees last week? What day was that? Thursday? I think I planted bees Thursday. I had rode until last the weekend before and then I planted the bees on Thursday because you gotta have them in by Patriots Day. My grandfather used to put them under uh, hot caps. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So I put in the peas and some lettuce and uh, a little bit of radishes. So. Tim, did you, did you look at the minutes yet? Grandfather was Harold Jones. I was my my father's father. Yeah. My, my mother's father. Yeah. father was Mr. McDonald's. A Burgess Gray. As very Burgess Gray. No, I just not exactly what I said. What I said was, I don't know where that I wanted from, this board to direct uh, the town manager to do an engineering and design study on the Cressy Road, right. so we have a number to well, that, place on the warrant. Right, and that makes it sound like it's a. Oh, uh, I'll call the uh, order. Would yeah, you please stand? No, that, that's that's not the way it's supposed to work. Well, I don't know if we can bring it out here to clarify it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Actually, on the agenda are the approval of the minutes from our last meeting, April 7th. We have one thing. We do. Tim's going to clarify it, I think. Well, Mr. Minkowski has brought to my attention uh, item, uh, what is it, four? Yep. Uh, what I said was I wanted the select board to direct the town manager to get a cost estimate for an engineering and design study for the Cressy Road so we could place that cost before the voters on a future warrant. The way it's worded it doesn't explain what I said or what I was asking for, and it doesn't make it clear that uh, about the warrant. That's the only thing I know. Anything healthy there? I don't know. It's really good. Right side of the side. Okay. As they say. Yeah. Okay. 
I make yes. a motion we approve the minutes with the uh, change. The amended minutes. Second. So motion by Harold, second by a like to approve the minutes with the change. All those in favor? Thank you. Yes, yes sir. Mm -hmm. I'd like to um, have a brief discussion about changing the way we do the minutes and just going to action minutes, especially now that we are um, uploading our Zoom meetings to YouTube so that if anyone wants to see an exact trans transcript of the meeting that they can watch it from there. But an exact, but just doing action minutes would be the motion, who was made the motion, who seconded it, and what the vote was. Eliminating the discussion and then you eliminate the possibility of someone being misquoted or misinterpreted. Any interest in doing that? We're only required yeah. to capture the motions. I, I, I'm interested in doing that. In, do you have any contemporary references for that? Or Just you? most of the most of the clerks that I know who do minutes for meetings. That's the, that's what they do, and that's what's recommended because then you're not misquoting somebody in the yeah. process. It'd be different if we were still doing the old way of not having any of our meetings go on for people to watch anymore. But that's actually the most accurate recording of our meetings is right on YouTube now. I would go along with that, uh, with the, uh, with also the addition of any uh, important uh, items of discussion, just being a synopsis, like Tim recommended that the board, you know, uh, ask you to, to uh, uh, get a cost estimate study and so forth of the Cressy Road. So, that's not a motion, but it's it's a significant point of discussion for a future uh, agenda item. So it, just a brief mention of that, say suggestion was made, doesn't have to go into any details or quotes, just suggestion was made to bring this up at a future meeting. Something like that of importance. And, and I agree with that. It's just that you can see just from this one thing tonight that it's misinterpreted or it's misworded so you've got the Zoom, you've got that audio to go back and capture that. I always take notes. When you instruct me to do things in the meeting, I'm writing it down. So I know what I'm supposed to do. The other thing I think I would suggest is if we go to just action minutes, when the public speaks though, a synopsis of what they, who they were and what they said. Because I think that that's important to catch. Let's think about it. Let's discuss it. It's worth it, I think. Yeah. yeah, let's discuss yeah. it, and, and and now we can we can maybe put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Well, I do. Does that sound good? I I I agree. I, I can bring samples of, of previous town managers. Uh, uh, what uh, they what they had for minutes for for at least for a period of time right there uh, in the past. If anybody's interested in that, but. Yeah, I was a secretary for several organizations and, and we we did action minutes, but we also captured important points of conversation like the executive board uh, didn't make a motion but wanted to you know have something like we just mentioned um, put on a future agenda then it was just noted that that item would be on a future agenda. Yeah. That's kind of what I do I, I do the minutes for the. Uh, Obama for museum trustees and for Barry Dexter Wilson Watershed Association. And, uh, but essentially, what I do, I will summarize and say there was a discussion of, and then uh, if we make a motion or decide on something. Right. Yes. Harold, if, if we made that change, would you be willing to go to action minutes if we made sure that we got those cards in there? I'm spending a great deal of time proofing the minutes. A lot. Well, let, let's let's discuss it uh, as okay. an agenda item on the next meeting, please. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank so you. Minutes have been approved. Uh, change uh, extra department reports. Uh, I think I see Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hello. Hi. Hey. Good evening. Um, going really have to report tonight is uh, Saturday, 
I'm going to be down at the transfer station from 10 to 2 for the drug take back. So if anybody has any unused, unwanted, or expired medications, um, I'll be at the transfer station from 10 to 2. I think it's worth telling uh, everyone how much you took back last year. It's usually a fairly significant amount. Last year, it was it was funny. Last year was just one. It was one full box, and I believe it was forty five pounds, if I remember right. Still, pretty, that's a pretty good amount of it. Of, of, uh, expired. Absolutely. Rather than going in the landfill, they're being disposed of properly. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, when is National Night Out this year? Uh, it'll be the first Tuesday in August. First Tuesday. Thank you. Yep. Correct. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Is anybody else there? Yeah, I'm here. Right. Oh, where are you? <laughs> How come you're not I'm at the, uh, Yeah, working my way back from Massachusetts. I'm at the uh, York uh, rest stop. So I'm pulled over. I'm safe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the fire department, uh, we've been. Uh, not too busy a call volume wise. Uh, we had a few calls the past two weeks. Most significant was uh, uh, an outdoor fire that almost turned into a structure fire just over the Monmouth line in Wales. Uh, it was a good stop uh, by Wales and Monmouth Fire Department and other mutual aid towns. So um, did a real good job saving that, that property. Um, on Saturday, we're gonna be going over to Highmore Farm. We're gonna be doing some ground cover fires. That's brush and grass fires. So that's some live fire training. So if you see smoke over there, that's just us practicing for outdoor fires. Um, speaking of that, we've actually had a pretty good spring so far this year, knock on wood. Uh, things greened up pretty quickly and we resulted in no red flag warning days. So that, that was good. Uh, for us, so hopefully that continues and things green up and we'll escape any significant outdoor wildfires. Uh, the Monmouth Fireman's Auxiliary is currently taking orders for our chicken to go dinner, and that's going to be on May 1st from 4 30 to 6 30 p.m. And uh, if you want to place orders because uh, you do need to pre order, you can just go to our Facebook page or the auxiliary Facebook page. And, uh, this contact information for a few of the auxiliary members to place orders. Hopefully you can hear me. It's downpouring right now. Um, BNS Paving, I met with them uh, a week ago and we looked at the parking lot and they're still on schedule for mid-May, uh, late May at the very latest to pave the parking lot at the center station. Um, they will be resealing the front pad. So there might be a day or two. We're gonna have to park our trucks elsewhere. And uh, you know, so stay out of the station while the front uh, you know seals up good. So looking forward to that finally happening. And then the last thing I have is the uh, Monmouth Beach Party. <clears throat> we're uh, we're in the process of doing our fundraising campaign, and I've been in touch with town manager to um, um, you know as far as the checks coming in. And, and whatnot, but it, it's it's brought up a, a question I have that I'd like to present to the board, and, and that is uh, going forward, where we're talking about doing something a little different with the committee and trying to separate it from the fire department. And I just want to get uh, some input from the board or from the town manager. Um, is this Monmouth Beach Party? Because it was created as something to do for the town as far as economic development and helping uh, local businesses advertise and, and whatnot to sponsor a, a fun event for the town. Is this uh, something we wanna continue to run through the town or is this something that the board would want us to separate uh, from the fire department and the town and create a, a completely different entity under the committee? Um, you know, where we'd have to go out and open an account and have checks made out to the Monmouth Beach Party opposed to the Monmouth Fire Department. 
And the reason for that is, you know, like tax exemption status and, and whatnot. So I'm just looking for some advice because, uh, you know, this year we're kind of already uh, too late and, and we're doing things through the town again. But, you know, I want to set this up for next year uh, to do it right. So I'm just looking for some advice on that uh, so I can steer the committee in the right direction. Chief, any what comments? Would, Chief, what would be the benefit of, of separating it out to you, to the fire department? Is there anything that, that you're tripping over right now, the way it's structured? <clears throat> Well, the, the, the way it's structured right now is um, if if businesses make a check out to the Monmouth Fire Department, it's it's and it's being deposited into a, a uh, bank account that's under the fire department, which we're going to be we're going to be closing that uh, real soon. And, and uh, we're going to be uh, filtering this money through uh, the, the fire department's revenue account. So it's uh, better tracked for auditing purposes. And because it was tied to the tax ID number for the town, and, and you know, businesses can, can write that off, you know, if they make a donation. Um, so by doing it through, through, the, through the town and the town tax ID number, if we keep things current like it is and just set things up through the revenue sharing, I think that would be fine. Um, the, or if, if the town feels or the board feels that we should just do a completely separate entity to remove anything from going through the town and, and being audited and, and just create a completely different entity, then you know, we have to set up a business account and, uh, or nonprofit status. Um, so the, there's some hoops that need to be jumped through, but um, I'd like to do this before the next, you know, next year's event, because it'll take several months to do that. But I, I guess I, you know, just kind of real quick, because I don't want to take too much time on this, but I, I just want to say that, you know, again, this this was kind of uh, the fire department or, or my brainchild and then, then getting together with the committee and the economic development committee uh, had some input on this. It, it was something about showcasing the town beach, all the renovations, uh, local businesses to attract businesses, um, you know, certainly a fun event for the townspeople. So um it's kind of a, a town sanctioned event, uh, hence why the fire department has been spearheading it. But um, I just want to be clear going forward. Do we want to continue that, you know, through the town or should we separate ourselves and just do a completely separate entity? I have no problem with the way it's set up now, but <clears throat> should you, uh, I, I think changing it to a, a separate nonprofit would be up to the committee members. And there are a lot of hoops to jump through. I did get you some information on that last year. Uh, you'll need to talk to an attorney and, and, and set up a number of things. And most likely you'll end up being a 501c4, not a c3. Because a c3, you have to have an education component. Uh, possibly you could argue that you're educating about Independence Day and the country's birth, uh, but uh, a 501c4. Uh, nonprofit status seems more likely, and those are not deductible as charitable uh, donations. Um, right. Businesses could still, I believe, but you'd have to get a lawyer's opinion on it, deduct their donation because technically, depending on the level that they donate at, they're buying advertising, and the higher the level, they're buying more advertising and more visibility. Right. Yes. The reason this is this has come up is, as you know, last year all the events were canceled. So this is the first time since I've been here that this event has um, <clears throat> occurred. So we received the application, which is on the agenda this evening, for TIF funds. Normally, TIF funds, uh, when they go to an event and based on the event application, have gone to a separate entity from the town, like a museum or you know some other group that's putting on an event and they apply through the TIF fund process. So I was questioning it because I said, where's the money? Who am I making this out to? Who's getting this? And who's being granted the money? Is it a committee or who? And so that's when Dan and I got into a conversation about the payment of the invoices and the fire department's account that it had, which was outside of the town accounts. Mm -hmm. So uh, checking with Dan, I asked him if it had been set up with a tax ID number using the town and checking with the auditors. And the auditor said it really needs to be audited because 
it's used the town tax ID number. So we're trying to work this out and do we separate this event out and have this committee, the beach party committee or Monmouth beach party become a committee of its own or does the town take it on? If the town takes it on, who is going to be responsible for it? Is, you know, is someone going to be assigned running this? What if Dan should leave someday and you know, then what happens? Is it going to be assigned to some employee who, you know, and then how do you get people to staff it if you don't have a volunteer group that's doing it? So Dan, how's the auxiliary uh, expenditures handled, the funding handled? Is that separate from the town? It is. They have their own separate account. Uh, they're considered nonprofit. They are not tax exempt, um, but they, uh, yeah, they're their own separate entities, completely separate uh, from the town. So the, the concern, the, the question I have regarding um, having the funding move through the town is that that I would think requires an appropriation. Even though the money's being raised outside of the budget, it's still an expenditure uh, of the town, so does that require an appropriation? So, if we if you choose to do it that way, then do we have to put it on a warrant as an appropriation item, like the like the uh, uh, you know the, the SWIFT program and all that stuff? That's you know we the voters authorize a certain level of, of expenditure, but in theory, the money's collected offset that exact amount of expenditure. That's, that's how it's supposed to work. It nevertheless has to be an appropriation item. So my experience with an event that's quasi municipally run would be um, South Portland's Art in the Park program. So it's a separate group that runs it. The library kind of spearheaded it to begin with. But when you look at all the enterprise accounts on the budget, Art in the Park is one of them that's listed. So I would imagine if we're taking in money and it's being donated to the town of Monmouth, it's not like it's a project that we're raising money for, like the academy or, you know, the lights in Tumston Hall. This is an event, so I'm thinking that it probably would, and I can check into it. I, I think that's an important piece of information yeah. to have before we make a final mm -hmm. decision. Yeah. Uh, so, once we know that, I think it'd be uh, easier to to make a determination of how we should proceed. I would hate to get into the. I would hate to get to the uh, point where we have to put that on the warrant every year as an item for appropriation. Which is one of the benefits of having a separate committee yes. doing it. Yep. Well, that brings up another question. We're getting ready to create another account for the 9/11 memorial fund that we need over the next five months raise you know upwards of twenty thousand dollars for and. Do we do we do that through our revenue, you know, pro, our line, or do we do that through the auxiliary and keep it completely out of the towns? And again, the issue is, you know, if you get a big donor that you know wants to donate a thousand dollars, if we do it through the auxiliary, that, you know, they're not tax exempt, so they wouldn't get that benefit. Whereas if it was made out to the Moth Fire Department it was tied to the tax exemption status, then they could benefit from that. Well, I already know the answer to this one. Okay. So this was this is a project, uh, a fundraising project. And so we can run that one through, but we need to wait for that June warrant um, question to be passed that authorizes yes, us yes. to do fundraising and then spend money from that fundraising specifically for the project for which the funds were raised. So that one, yes. That's a one Line. Yeah, and that's a one-time project that will be done in the fall. So, you know, that that's short term. Whereas the the event for the Monmouth Beach Party would be a, an annual thing where funds could roll over from year to year. So that's another issue. All right, uh, if we can table this, maybe table this to the next meeting, and then Linda and I can do some more research and then get back to you uh, regarding that. Uh, that would be great. Okay. Hey, Dan, I have a question. Yes. Their uh, friends of Cumston Library here are doing uh, Mayfair this year, kind of uh, maybe somewhat reduced, but they'll be doing it. And I was wondering if uh, the, the uh, Junior fire department members want to do a fundraiser, the, the cooking, or is that really just too much? The 
Yeah. Uh, what's what's? Do you have a date yet for that? Yes, it's May twenty second. Yeah. Right, I'll get I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Good. Any other questions for the fire department? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you there. Uh, could I, if, could Linda, could I get Bill to go? Before me? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> you want to, Bill, you want to go? Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's see. Over here. Yeah, go around that way. Oops. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a few handouts. Your assessment dollars to work. The budget. Uh, and I've got uh, six copies here of a summary of the Wilson Pond project that we're getting ready to really kick into high gear this summer. And then finally, uh, couple documents. I think you may have already seen both of these. Uh, one was from November 2020. It's a one page summary that we put out regarding the reintroduction of the map to lakes and ponds and privacy watershed. And the in, uh, informational uh, piece for the town. And then finally is a position statement that our position that our board um, formally adopted on March 30th regarding that topic of reintroduction of the fish. I know Linda, I sent you, did, did you forward those items off to the board uh, report? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but um, yeah, there's, uh, there's also a, a, a 31 page report a study that I've been working on for the last year and a half that I prepared that. Um, that, um, that I made available to all of the towns and the district electronically. Um, before I get to the budget, I just want to, because I don't want to have to talk about that too much time at all. But uh, I would be uh, happy. In fact, I would like it at some point in the future. There's no real rush, I don't think, but I would like maybe a half hour of your time at some point to uh, present a brief PowerPoint uh, presentation on that topic of reintroduction of it. Uh, if an atlas fish, which essentially analyzes what we're looking at. So, and Bill, uh, Linda did send that report to us. Okay. And I did read it. Okay. I thought it was very well stated. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, you know, there's another camp out there with an opposing uh, uh, opinion, and that's always going to be the case. And so, um, I'm sure there's going to be debates in the future on that. So, um, so I just want to just let you know is that I know that um, I've been made aware by another town that um, uh, a uh, private advocacy group, volunteer group out of Gardner upstream has contacted the municipalities, um, um, uh, inviting themselves or offering to come and give a presentation to the town. We don't need to jump start or be ahead of them. That's not the issue. So they've given us their presentation in the middle of March at a meeting. And you know, like I say, I gave my presentation to the board on the 30th and uh, so um, this is something that's probably going to have a lot of uh it's gonna be a lot of discussion at it um about it um hopefully there's going to be some discussion uh, hopefully it's not going to be swept under the rug but uh the budget that i handed up was that's what i'm mostly here for tonight um primarily is um, the reason I wanted to come and talk to you tonight, uh, some years I think I could maybe, I don't think I have snuck by, but some years, you know, it's just been a normal or an average, usual 3% normally have gone with that usually has reflected things like our increase in rent, increase in health insurance, actually that's a little bit higher, or two or 3% of cost of living increase, in, as you can see on our budget. Um, personnel is 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 is, is, a, is a pretty good chunk of our overall operating budget. Um, last year, uh, because of COVID, um, we immediately just put a freeze on our budget for the year. We decided there was no way we were going to uh, make any attempt to uh, increase assessments, and uh, um, we knew that by doing that, we would not be we were not going to be able to hire a summer intern like we have been doing for the last 15 years. Like the two people in the boat. 
But we also knew that because of COVID, we weren't going to put two people in the boat, nor would we put two people in a pickup truck to tow the boat. And especially a college student. <laughs> so uh, Ryan did all the lake monitoring last year for the most part uh, by himself, which is not really our preferred method. We um, like to have two in the boat, but he was, he was able to get that done. Uh, this year, what we're looking at is a is a five percent increase in municipal assessments, um, and um, the reason for doing that is again we're not going to have uh, a full summer intern uh, work with us this year. However, we do have a, an intern here who was a summer intern but lives locally and still in our basis paychecks. Last year worked. I don't know, a couple thousand, fifteen hundred dollars worth of hours. So we did have, we did need some some help in some cases. So we've we've added a little bit more to our budget this year for personnel and a little bit for a one or a one and a half percent. We'll figure out what that is on a, a cost of living increase. Because I think it is one and a half percent this year. Um, the reason uh, and, and I highlighted some of the some of the big changes or uh, notable uh, items uh, in red. Uh, the monitoring expenses uh, have gone up about almost five thousand uh, um, dollars over uh, previous years. We've been budgeting about ten thousand two hundred fifty every single year for about the last five, six, seven years. And the state, the state of health and environmental testing lab, has not changed their their rates, their their, their fees for laboratory analysis in any of those years. And last year, um, they had. Uh, uh, last year, they, they wanted to raise them. They were, they were proposing, and there was going to be a public hearing last year for HEAL um, in May, and they were proposing to raise their rates for phosphorus, which is one a new uh, a, a variable a parameter that we always saw for a lot of our lake, uh, our, especially our big lakes, and that's what cobs, et cetera, because that's the nutrient of the pollutant of concern. They're raising the rate for that one, one parameter, 80%. And so um, that, that's a big jump. And then for chlorophyll, which is another one of our main uh, uh, parameters. In fact, those are really only the big two that we actually have the state test. And chlorophyll, which is an indication of the amount of algae in the water, um, um, they were raising 60 or 67%. It was about two thirds percent. So, so overall, our budget for monitoring went up $4,750 for this year. And we, we had to eat that. So um, if you look down um, the next, uh, I'm not going to, the things that are black really haven't changed much, as you can see. So the red item uh, for contractual and NPS direct, those are really for grants. And that, uh, primarily for this year, it was 6,000 in contract. That's the Friends of Cobbacy Watershed. That's for working with us on the Cobbacy Lake 319 non point source pollution project. And the 27,250 is for paying for direct costs associated with that grant. Uh, that grant is not gonna be on this next fiscal year. So um, we will have only one grant in this next fiscal year. And I gave you a handout with a summary of that, this Wilson Pond project. And the thousand dollars in red, that will be for the Friends of Cobbacy Watershed that are working with us on Wilson Pond. And the $2,500 is also for direct costs for that project. Well, going down to health insurance benefits, um, uh, I, I kept them frozen for what we proposed last year because I don't know if the town has main units for employee health trust or which plans you have, but we use the PPO 1500 at the Cobbacy Watershed and uh, District. And uh, thankfully, uh, last year in January is when they uh, make their adjustments. They did not; they made no increases in in, uh, in health insurance. And I usually budget about seven percent um, uh, annually. Because um, they've been doing things like that, seven or nine percent. They didn't raise it last year. So, uh, as you can see, I'm only in the left two columns. I'm only looking to spend, we're only looking to spend around 29000 so for health insurance. But I still expect that seven percent increase to kick in probably this coming year. Right. I, you know, so, I had a budget for that. Um, going down, nothing else has really changed much. If you, have, if you see anything that stands out that you have a question about, uh, please let me know. The other thing in red is down in the income uh, below the 5%, and that should be 5% for actually the uh, district contributions. Um, I rounded $1 uh, up instead of down. Um, and so it added 65 cents, and yeah, that's a 5.01 cent. Uh, cent but, um, 
uh, Dan Wells is happy. Um, let's see, uh, federal state grants of twelve thousand. That seventeen thousand is the Wilson Pond grant. That's a sure thing. We have that contract. We're 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 working on that grant now. We're just getting into high gear. Five thousand of that of that seventeen thousand is a mystery grant. Well, I mean, I know what I'm I know what I'm proposing, but I don't know if we're going to have that five thousand dollars. That that fifth seventeen thousand might be twelve in income, and so I'm gambling um, that that's going to be there to help balance the budget. The proposals for three nineteen are due um, May twenty six, and I'm not going to know um, uh, until July maybe uh, or so. If we both awarded that grant, uh, which would be a phase three grant for Thomas C. Lake. So um, we have, now I've been here 29 years, and I think there's only been about two or three instances where we have been, where we failed to secure a grant when we put the proposal. We've been very successful. And uh, nobody at DEP can guarantee us anything, but uh, they've given me good feedback on the third uh, phase for Cobbacy Lake because we still have a lot of work to do on, on that it's a big watershed, big, a big lot of camp roads, a lot of roads. Uh, and lastly, is the last red thing is um, we will still be forwarding 7,955 from our reserves. And um, that's not something we want to do. And like I say, if we don't get that other grant, that 7,955 will turn into like 12,955. And um, so um, we we understand exactly where where we're at. We have a good sense. We hope we think uh, where municipalities are at. Um, we're coming out of the COVID this year. Hopefully, things are going to improve. I am totally unaware of what the situation is with uh, COVID relief for municipalities, state government, and that. You probably know way more about it than I do. I have researched that. I hope it's going to be very very good for everybody. Uh, hopefully, it will help. Uh, Offset any losses in state revenue sharing as a result of the loss in sales taxes and things like that. But um, uh, I'm hoping that um, I mean this. Uh, I've run this by several towns. Manchester, uh, Winthrop was was good with this, or at least they didn't say anything. So um, I just you know, this one, I'm going to entertain any questions on the budget here. So for the record, Bill. Because it's it's being recorded. Yeah. Just if you could briefly explain uh, why the budget, the overall budget, is going down. Proposed budget is going down from three hundred twenty-two eight eighty-five. Oh, excuse me, three hundred twenty-three five ninety-four, uh, which was the budget last year, to three hundred and two thousand. But the municipal assessment is going up five percent. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you look, uh, you look under the income column down below. Under federal state grants, you see forty-seven thousand two hundred five. Last year, um, uh, like I say, Cobbsy Lake Phase Two that I'm still working on. We had to get an extension, but I, I, I've already it's already been budgeted for, so it's it's going to be capital you know, accounts receivable. But I I'm not going to keep kicking it into every budget going down the road. Uh, uh, that 47,205 also included uh, the Allen treatment for Cottonwood and Lake, part of that grant as well. Those grants are gone, and so that's income is lost. And so, um, and if you take that 47,205, and if you look up above, for which I, I mentioned, like the contractual and the non point source direct, which is money that passes through Providence Watershed, we get it out of that 47,205. We're then paying 27250 for direct costs on camp road repairs. We're paying the Friends of Cobbacy $6,150. So if you add the $6,150 and the $27,250, you've got, there's that $33,400. Subtract that from the $47,000, and you have for Cobbacy Watershed really about a net of about $14,000 to support our staff. And, and this year, um, we don't have that. We also have the increase, like I say, in the monitoring expenses of almost five thousand dollars. So, um, and if you so if we boil that down, what you're telling us is the federal grant money, besides directly funding a specific project or projects, also provides enough funds to help offset your administration administrative costs. Oh, I wouldn't call it administrative; it's personnel costs, and it's personnel costs associated with the grant. We don't have uh, the personnel time. We don't, item, we don't have a line for staff time as it applies to the grants. It's 
within the staff time is the grant time. And so if we didn't have, uh, if we didn't get the grants, we would not have enough to have the personnel line, the staff at full time. So again, because the, the voters need to understand what they're being asked to pay for, the grant money that was specific to certain projects is gone. That specific 47205 is gone. Right. And as you just stated, that that there was approximately 12,000 of that, I think, that was used to, uh, that was not required for direct payment to the project, but was used to offset Cobsey Water District costs. And those costs are related to staffing? Yes, staffing that was supporting the grants. So since you don't have the grant anymore, do you need that staffing? Yes, in fact, um, to be honest with you, um, because um, we uh, have to do grants, we cannot attend to other parochial matters at the local level. Wendy Dennis, who you probably know, uh, for one, has built up probably four to 500 hours of compensation time. And we do not pay overtime. We don't pay compensation time because she has been forced into, because she does a lot of water levels management, she does a lot of the milfoil uh, oversight on lakes like Anabesico. She was managing the two Cobbsey Lake projects or Cottonwagen project um, um, that um, her time had, had gotten so, uh, you know, so with overtime, we had, we had to pay her for a lot of that overtime out of, it's from an ethical standpoint. You just don't not pay so. But um, <clears throat> what I'm getting at, Harold, is just because the grants are done, doesn't mean you don't have work to something justify the staff time. The, the, the grants, put it this way, I wish we didn't have grants. There was a period when um, we were very close to being grant independent. And the only thing that, the only value that I find in some of the grants is they give us the construction related money to do the work on the, on the camp roads. But they also require us to commit time and do some things that are required by EPA and DEP that we feel are superfluous to just simply doing a camp road, and, but their requirements, the administration, the report writing, and things like that, that then deny us time to be attentive to the eight towns of the district or the planning boards and everything else. So it's, there's, there's always something to do. So it's, it's not so as if, I, again, I, I'm, I'm asking you to explain this for the voters, because they're the ones that are going to make this decision. I thought I just did. Well, uh, you have started, but I think if, if I might, um, maybe this is an accurate understanding, maybe it isn't. The people, the staff time that was funded by these grants is still necessary to uh, research and write other grants and do other staff work. Is that accurate? You have, you're saying you have things to do. So I'm just trying to have you clarify if those are some of the things that, that you need to do that aren't directly related to these grants that no longer are, are well, uh, done. Uh, again, um, when we're doing these grants, we're also working overtime to do the work that is required to do what's needed to be done in the policy watershed. These grants have more or less benefited the taxpayers and the residents here because they have enabled us to not increase assessments any higher than necessary. But nobody is working only 40 hours a week at the Cobb Sea Watershed District except for our water resource technicians. But I'll tell you, Dean and Wendy are certainly, um, and we're not getting paid the overtime, at least I've never done. But, um, the thing is, is that uh, all of the work in, uh, that I feel is justified by the budget in the 2022 proposed has been getting done and is going to continue to be getting done. And uh, if we don't get those things, <coughs> thankfully, we won't have to work 50 hours a week. I won't have to come in on Saturdays and Sundays to work on things. Um, there's, uh, but because we have been getting that grant money, We've been able to keep it maybe at a lower uh, assessment increase as well. 
just I'm not trying to be difficult, but just no, I understand. I just uh, well, I, I guess what I guess what I can tell, I can say is that um, the the alternative would be for us then to uh, have our staffing time simply uh, rated relative to grants, and so if we were to then uh, reduce our staff time so that the the town's portion or whatever and drop staffing hours to thirty five hours, all that would mean is that we would then be adding about five extra compensation hours a week. To everyone's overtime here, or else they wouldn't be able to do the work. The work and get done. Just, just want to have as clear an explanation as possible out there because when the voters look at the warrant this year, mm -hmm. they're going to be under a lot of pressure. As the school uh, is going to be looking for uh, better than a mill, uh, more of their money, um, and uh, you know, so uh, there's there's always the potential that the any part of the budget or the whole budget will get kicked back. Right. Yeah. I'd like to think that Thank town you. Mom doesn't feel like they have haven't been getting their their uh, value for what they paid the Cottonwood Watershed District um, over the last so many years. Um, we've done. Uh, I'm doing a Wilson Pond project that's right now. We've done a, a two phases of policy. We just did two, pro three projects on Pocknawagan Lake. Of all the towns in the district, I'd say Monmouth has probably got the best bang for a buck. And I'll, I mean, I'll, I can honestly say that, and I could probably be able to demonstrate that for you too. Yep. Um, so it's uh, there's a lot going on in Monmouth with regard to policy watershed. And what you know, the, the policy grant last year I had. Three or four road projects done in Mon uh, on Cobbesy Lake in all four towns. And I don't, there's five, I know West Gardner is not a member town, so I haven't been doing work there. We upgraded uh, Rocky Point, we upgraded Boynton Road, we upgraded uh, Frost Drive, and there was one other one. And I met with the property owners on Maple Ridge. And I've gotten in a cost share agreement with Maple Ridge Island Road Association three weeks ago. And that's going to probably be the most expensive grant related road project I've done on any grants. They're going to pay a good portion of that and it's going to be supported by our policy. So, and uh, so I don't know. It's, uh, I mean, I, I personally feel that Cobbs Watershed District provides pretty good value. So. And that's what I wanted you to explain because this is being recorded on Zoom and, and a wider okay. range of uh, audience will have access to it if they choose to do that. So in order for you to make your case for your 5% increase in funding, I wanted you to give some uh, some of that explanation. No, I, I perfectly understand. Bill, Bill, I got a question about the com yeah. uh, compensatory time. Um, that can't be an unfunded liability. You have to be able, if somebody decides they want that money, you have to be able to cash that out at their request at the time they request it. Is that is that Not how it's working? So. Not if you're an exempt employee. I didn't realize they were exempt employees. We have exempt employees, employees that are supervisory, write their own proposals, make okay. their own hours, essentially, you know. Uh, there's only two of us that are exempt. Well, um, that explains it for me then, okay? I didn't, yeah. I didn't. okay, great, thanks. There's not exempt and exempt employees. Uh, not, uh, exempt employees are not entitled to overtime, so federally. And uh, it's always in the district policy. If somebody uh, resigns, leaves, retires, quits, gets fired, whatever, and they have unused vacation time, you have to pay them for that. You have to pay what we have. That's our policy. And uh, we, you know, there's a ceiling of 192 hours you can accumulate. So that's the most you can be paid. Um, and we don't pay for unused sick time, um, and we don't have to. We don't have to pay for comp time. I've always urged the staff for as long as I've been there. As long as you're not maxing out your vacation, so you can still accumulate, so you don't lose it. If you don't use it, you lose it. As long as you're still accumulating it, you have to have some date you want to take the time off, and you have comp time too, because you can use comp time in lieu of work. You just don't get cash for it. You can take time off. So I tell them use your comp time first. And save your vacation time because that's that's the only thing with cash value to you if, if it's unused. Okay, um, I'm not sure about the exempt employee part. I just yeah. know if it was one of Linda's employees' compensatory time that you 
you rack up, yes, you can take that off, but you also have to be able to, if somebody wants to cash it out, that's time earned. So you'd have uh, to, but you're no. talking, we're talking two different things and I didn't realize we were talking exempt employees. Well, see, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. exempt employees, let's say can work from home, at home, and they can put on their timesheet their hours if they're working. But like, you know, like Wendy, if she's working on a report at home, and she's on the weekend, she's just, she has the work to do. She's not trying to bank the hours. Um, she puts on her timesheet. Uh, that's at her, that's at her. She can do that if she wants. But, but um, I, you know, I don't have to um, authorize that, that component. But at the same time, um, uh, I also can't verify. So why should we be forced to pay them? Exempt, exempt employees above a certain salary level. $51,000 a year. Correct. That's right. Are not subject to, are not subject to the, the, what Mike's asking. That's right. And, and that was the part I did. And if they were supervised for position, and they also are themselves like a project manager. Exactly. Right. Right. Okay. I'm yeah. fine. Yeah. I just thought it was, you know, like an office help or something like that. You're talking about it's a separate thing. Right. Yep. Thanks. No, that's good. That's a good question, right? Because not a lot of people know that. I think we have our board probably is aware of that. So um anything else in the budget. Okay, well, I just uh, I gave you that summary for the Wilson Pond project. Uh, that's an important project for us to update yeah. the watershed based plan because. We have previously conducted a phase, phase one of phase two on Wilson Pond and your staff. Wilson Pond is still struggling water quality wise, and it is not eligible for us to pursue federal grants to do work in that watershed because in 2009, the, uh, 2019, the watershed based plan, which was approved by EPA and, and DEP, Boston, DEP Region One, and DEP. That expired. They're good for ten years, and so we have a grant to update that because it's, it's time consuming to do it. So you, they do award you grants to do the updating. So we'll get that uh, watershed based plan updated, and then we need, there's more work to do in the Wilson Pond watershed. So um, anyway, and others, and and the best cook too. <laughs> so. You all set. I'm all set. Thank you, Bill. 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 Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I just have a few things. I wanted to let the board know that we are putting the ad in uh, the papers and in various um, construction journals and places where uh, construction type people look for bids and RFPs uh, for the North Main and the Beach Street sidewalk project. We're going to hold off on doing uh, Maple until we work out some issues that we have with the Maine Department of Transportation on some of the drainage issues down there. They have some water concerns and we're still talking about catch basins, but um, we are going to move forward with this with a final, we're gonna be working around the beach party. So we'll do North Main first and then uh, start to do Beach Street after the Beach Friday in July. So we won't be disrupting anything there with a final completion date um, of October 1st on that project. We're still waiting for the permit from the Department of uh, Environment, Environmental Protection for Wilson Pond Culvert project. And that work will be taking um, place this summer at some point, possibly late summer. We're trying to make these projects as flexible as possible because a lot of these contractors are busy and their prices, uh, the less flexible we are, the higher their prices will be. So we're trying to be a little flexible on that. So it could be early fall before the Wilson Fund uh, culvert is replaced. But at some point during that project, there'll be a couple of weeks where that road is gonna to have to be closed, which I know is a major inconvenience for people because they have to drive all the way around. We will post that in plenty of time so that people know that that's happening. Uh, just want to let the public know that the town office is going to be closed next Wednesday and Thursday until one o'clock each day. Main uh, Bureau of Motor Vehicles is coming down to do an extensive motor vehicle training with the front office staff. Anyone who needs the code enforcement officer on Wednesday uh, should call the office and uh, hit the extension for the code enforcement officer. Daniel will be in and be available for uh, meeting with people on that day. 
Lastly, I have an email from the Recreation Committee from Pat Hash. Uh, she wanted me to uh, let you know that the Recreation Committee is again recommending the same rules apply to the beach as were applied last summer. And that would be that the beach uh, is open to Monmouth residents and their guests only. And the guests must be in the presence of the resident. Passes will be available at the entrance to the beach to those providing proof of residency. A guard will be present at the entrance uh, to check for residency. And out of town children who have been enrolled in swimming lessons may continue them. This was the process that was used last year and the select board was happy with that. Uh, so Pat wanted me to pass that on to you. She is on the Zoom meeting if there are any questions about that. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, next is uh, select board reports. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then public comments. Any public comments? I see Sandy Schiller has Sandy. her hand up. Uh, you're muted, I think. Hey, Chris. You're, you're good now. Okay, I'm good now. Okay, took a time delay. I just have a question. Has the time passed uh, to submit nomination uh, papers? Yes. It has passed. Okay, can we have a uh, an update then, or not an update? We don't know, uh, except for those that have kind of leaked out. Who's running for what position so far? I can answer that, uh, Sandy. For the select board seat, uh, we have Kent Ackley and uh, Daniel Dumont. For the RSU uh, two board seat, uh, Leanne Burnham is running for re-election. And for the library trustee position is Pamela Kelly. Pamela Kelly, okay. Great, thank you. Welcome. Anything else? That was it? Okay. Linda, I have a quick question, if I may. Oh, yeah. Hi, Donna. Oh, hey, sorry. I didn't know if you saw my hand hiding in here. I actually have... Um, two questions and then a comment. Um, my first question is, Linda, at the beginning of this, you mentioned that about the YouTube channel for the town. And I was wondering if that was posted anywhere on the website because I wasn't able to find a link or where I might find those videos of the town meetings. Oh, that's a good question, Donna. Um, Dennis is actually working on our website right now and moving things around a little bit. I'll have to check on that for you and we'll make sure that that's a prominent uh, link to the YouTube station. Uh, yeah, just by the way, the website's looking awesome. I mean, I went found minutes really easily. They were all there and in order. So it was really exciting. Um, my second question, I'm not sure who could answer this. Um, there is going to be a drug take back day at the transfer station. Um, along the same lines, does, is there going to be any kind of free dump day or a chemical dump day? I think we've done in the past with Augusta. What happens is uh, now you have a uh, punch card where you get uh, certain things uh, throughout the year. So you don't, you're not limited to one day. Uh, Got it. I think like ten dollars in demo, a couple of tires, one free on appliance, and then they they click your punch card or exit off. And uh, in the past, there has been a hazardous materials uh, drop off day. Uh, generally, um, I can't remember who's uh, organized that in the past, but I think it was I think it was Chief Mulheron, and uh, that involves pre registration <laughs> With Augusta, each individual. Yeah, it was in Augusta. What they're bringing in and how much, and there's a specific day they can be dropped off. I think it was Herb Whittier who, who really organized. Yeah, I don't know. Like, was it Herb? Yeah. And the be. chief was shaking his head, Tim. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I thought it would be helpful. I know I took advantage of that hazardous day like several years ago. 
um, with some old paint and stuff that was in our house and chemicals that were here when we first purchased it. So I know that it's really helpful and it was in Augusta. So I don't know if there's someone that could find that out for everyone and just let us know in the future if there's something like that opportunity made to Monmouth residents, that would be really um, helpful. I'll look in. Okay, and then my only other statement is that um, at the beginning, I, I'm not sure the conversation in total because I did have to step out for a minute, um, but I think Dan was talking about the beach party and I would caution people that if the intent is to have contributions be tax deductible, a 501c4 would not be the route while it's tax exempt, um, contributions would not be tax deductible for those people that donated. So, and I know you at the end you were tabling it, but just wanted to put that out there. And thank you. Donna, if your paint is one of your concerns, you know that you can dry the paint out and then turn it in, right? Oh yeah, I do. Yep. I just know that um, some people had asked me what we had done with all the chemicals that we had in our house. It wasn't just paint. There were a lot of stuff. Um, and I said, hey, there was a free day that the town advertised in Augusta. And because it came up, I just thought, hey, you know, I should ask about that when I heard the chief mention the take back the, the drug thing at our um, transfer station. But because I haven't heard actually in a few years. I mean, it was a while ago. I don't know. Well, the only thing I will bring up is that uh, three years ago we participated and no one uh, brought anything from Monmouth. Now, whether it was poorly advertised or or there just wasn't anything to go, I, I don't know, but I don't think it's happened since, but uh, probably would be a good thing for us to make that contact and, and uh, make that opportunity available. Thanks. People should have a way to dispose of unwanted well, pesticides. Paint, paint thinner, pesticides, whatever it is. Yep. There's a number of things you shouldn't just throw in the hopper. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And I will add that uh, our transfer station does take all universal waste. Anything with mercury in it is sorted and properly disposed of. Computers. Are, are disposed of TVs, monitors, printers, uh, all those things are done. Some things have fees, some things do not. Mostly universal waste does not. You could also go to, for pesticides and that kind of thing, you go to the state website under the board of pesticides. And I think it's Gary Fish that's still running that. And um, I believe they have some uh, disposal options listed for you on that and disposal collection site. The only one I will bring up is I have discovered it is notoriously difficult to get rid of a propane cylinder. Might be good information to find out where that can be taken care of. But I'm not talking about the 25 pound cylinders because the places where you refill them will take those, even the obsolete ones. It's the little small ones. The one pounders and the, and the uh, torch cans? Yeah. Very difficult to get rid of those. They really don't like them going through the hopper and into the into the uh, <laughs> incinerator because it explodes. Why is he going to take them through the uh, metal container yeah. down, down yeah. below? That's what I've done with mine. Yeah. So you're not supposed to. I, I'm not supposed to do it unless you physically pierce the container. Right. It's not. It, 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 it's yeah. it's a it's a potential, yeah, really. it's a potential explosion hazard unless it's been vented, yeah. so that it can't you know it can no longer stop gas from escaping. So like Sim said, punctured. There is a vent, right? But that vent can close. So unless you pierce the shell, like Tim just said, then it's considered an explosion hazard. The reason I say that is because I have a. Cylinder I've been trying to get rid of recently. It's not easy to get rid of those things. Any other public comments? Nobody? Nobody there. <clears throat> yeah, somebody's got their hand up. I can't see who it is. Dan Roy. <laughs> yeah, it looks like Dan. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. 
So I, I failed to mention earlier, uh, we, the Red Cross is doing a blood drive at our fire station next Thursday from 12 to five. We still have some open slots. So if you go to the Red Cross website, you can pre-register for a time slot. So I just wanted to mention that. And uh, as far as the propane tanks, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, make, make sure all the propane is completely exhausted or spent and uh, those small ones you can dispose of them in the metal waste uh, recycle bin, uh, but it's good if you can pierce, pierce it just to assure that there's no uh, residual vapor that's inside the tank. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Drive safely. Seth, uh, yes, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to just mention one thing. Sure. Since we have quite a few people on, all of the budget documents have put, been put on a prominent place on our website. Um, all of the spreadsheets, the uh, warrant itself is up there. But we've, I've also included some photographs. Uh, we had an aerial done of the old middle school because we know that question 32 and question 33, especially question 32 is pretty confusing. And so it's a little rudimentary, uh, excuse my drawing skills, but I have done the best I can uh, to show what question 32 will do to the buildings on that site, which ones will be saved, which ones will be removed. And then on question 33, um, which ones will be totally removed and which one will stay. So if anyone has any questions about that, a lot of people like visuals and I thought that that might be helpful. We are working on putting some kind of a white paper up that will be just totally factual about uh, what's available um, at that site and what might happen up there and how we get to where we are. But just want to let people know, I know that that, can, that question is going to be confusing and I want people to have plenty of opportunity to look at those photos and the language before they go to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any, nothing else there. All right, uh, next is, um, Request for $2,500 in TIF funds for the Monmouth Beach Party. Uh, this application came to me uh, last week, I believe, uh, from Don Hodgson, who is one of the members of this group, putting on this event. Uh, I will note that um, the event application is, was on the economic development website. I pulled, you know, pulled it off of there, and that's where people usually uh, pull this from. I'm not sure when this was created, but I think we may want to amend it. Uh, the committee is asking for $2,500 for the event out of TIP funds, but the, uh, the event form actually says the maximum amount is $1,000. So I think that that could be confusing for people uh, I believe that the Monmouth Museum, when it has asked in the past, has probably abided by that thousand dollar maximum. No, they have not. They have. They've asked for three thousand every year they do their Apple Fest. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And the board has given it to them. It, it still may make sense to take that thousand dollar maximum off. Well, I think it should be removed at this yeah. particular point. Um, the, the check, uh, as I was checking into this, uh, will be made out to the fire department, which our tip attorney has assured me is fine. So this is an order for your approval this evening. Will we approve the $2,500 in TIF event funds for the Monmouth Beach Party? Second. So there's a motion by Harold, second by Mike to approve the request for $2,500 in TIF funds. All those in favor? And I abstain. Wait, is there a maximum? Or Tim, you know. Pardon me. Is there a max? There was a maximum amount that was put there for some reason. Is there a maximum? I it was a thousand dollars. It was done by committee. I was not involved in the design of, of that or any of the decisions. Uh, and that committee was actually led by uh, a gentleman named Steve Biro, who used to live in town. He works at Tech Tech, and a number of other people that have since moved on. But uh, uh, there was a reason for that uh, at the time. Uh, was considered because uh, they didn't think that defense would really cost a lot of money. And it was it's primarily for advertising and, and, and other things to help assist uh, getting that event to go and, and, and be worthwhile. Um, at some point, you know, when these things are coming through, we're going we're to have to have some way to make sure that these requests aren't 
affecting our ability to maintain any uh, bonding that's being associated with the TIF. What I'm saying is sustain sustainability. You know, we've got a, about 13 years left on it. So, you know, everything we do has to be structured around what's available after we, we do bonds like the sidewalks and so on and so forth. And these things come through, we just have to make sure that it's sustainable. So at some point there might be a maximum. I don't, and that's why I asked if that was part of it. Well, there's, yeah. there's, um, there is a, a budget and, and I think the budget for events was $5,000. So once that would be reached, obviously uh, we would not, or and probably, uh, want to entertain more requests uh yeah you know uh, to, to keep within that guideline we unless had, it was something really important and we've had a healthy fund balance in that account but we are <laughs> we're starting to use it we're doing uh tip projects that are germane to what the spirit and intent of the, the tip language was so just I'm watching what yeah. um, has already been approved for um, projects to come out of there, the sidewalks that were mentioned right. earlier, plus if the voters approve the downtown sidewalks this summer and um, you know anything else that might come out of there, I'm watching that uh, as far as the budget goes. But I think, and one thing that you will do after the June election is you will look at the $120,000 that we get from that tip and it'll be up to this board to distribute that among the various lines. Um, we have depleted this year the professional line with uh, bond council and TIF council, but um, so we'll want to put some more money in there. But there's an event line yeah. that I, <clears throat> we can have a bigger conversation about this after the election, but you know, there's some money that might want to be moved around in there too to make sure that we're covering the streetscapes project. Exactly, exactly. I think that's what I was trying to mm -hmm. reinforce. Thank you. Uh, only, uh, if I might just add, the only other thing we may want to look at in the future, I don't think we need to worry about it right now, but uh, as that substation ages, uh, depreciation um, and, and uh, other things will kick in and the assessment on it will go down mm -hmm. and that may affect the revenue from the, from the TIF. So we need to, to look at that in the in the near future to just to make sure we're not going to, to help distance that. And that's another good point that goes along with the big picture of this as we start tipping into those funds. <clears throat> okay, anything else? Yeah. Uh, next thing is to the abatement of uncollectible taxes for uh, a lot, two lots, I guess, in West Village, Mobile Home Park. I'll let the rest of you go ahead. I've been dealing with um, the owner of this park on these two lots now pretty much since I got here. Um, there's a law that requires anyone moving a mobile home over the roads to get a permit from the town. And when I sign off on the permit, there's a place that says that the taxes have been paid. And I can't say that on here because the people who own these mobile homes abandoned them a couple of years ago. Mobile home park owner has tried to contact them without success. Uh, when this first came to me last year, it hadn't been long enough for me to say, yes, we've been trying to collect these for two years because the statute is very specific about that. At this point, I've included in here an oath that I swore in front of a notary saying that we have attempted to collect these taxes. We uh, allowed the, uh, working with our town attorney, allowed the mobile home park uh, to sell the mobile homes to hopefully get some money that he could help pay on the taxes. And at that time, that was a month ago, he didn't get enough to pay anything on the taxes and also pay on his own expenses. So without, we're considering that to be another attempt to um, try to collect. And so at this point, I can honestly tell you that there's no way I'm going to be collecting on this. And so you would be abating uh, total taxes on the two of these lots and a little over $2,400 total which also includes fees for filing the liens and sending the notices. We know for the rest of the board, excuse me, for the rest of the board, because I don't really, I'm, I'm gonna let the rest of you guys discuss this, but this has happened before with the same owner. Um, I guess I would, I'm, I'm all set. 
So that's one you guys be aware of. Yeah, just like a clarification, it, it, and I don't know, I'm not current on this, but it used to be that if a, if a mobile home had wheels underneath it, wasn't permanently fixed to the ground, that it wasn't um, subject to property tax. It used to be that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is now. So it's important to understand in what condition these were. If they were moved out, did wheels get put under them? What? How were they taxable? I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be all set with abating the taxes. I'd just like to know going forward from a from a, a regulatory point of view, um, are all mobile homes in a mobile home park subject to property tax, or is the park's land what is subject to property tax unless the homes are permanently affixed to the law? I'm not an assessor, so I want to make that disclaimer right off. My understanding is all mobile homes in mobile home parks are taxable, whether they're on wheels or not. The land underneath them is the real estate owned by the park itself. So he's paying property tax on that mobile home park land. Um, Would you just ask for a clarification? I will do Donna that, to... yep, yep. Clarify what the current law is. I can tell you, uh, we do not want to take possession of mobile homes. All right. It would cost us a lot more to dispose of them than it's of what they owe. One of the things that Kurt told me when I got here, and I, this is something I want to discuss in a few weeks when we talk about foreclosed properties, but Kurt said you never want to take possession of a mobile home, especially in a mobile home park, because it just costs a fortune to get rid of it. And um, there is a way that we can also not foreclose on these properties, which you know we'll discuss in more depth that night. But we automatically foreclose after 18 months from a lien being placed in the registry. <coughs> but there's a way to stop that from happening on places like a mobile home in a mobile home park or like a junkyard. And those are places that the town really doesn't want to own because then you become liable for either disposing of them or in the, the case of a junkyard, any kind of hazardous materials that have seeped into the land, all that hazardous mitigation uh, could become the liability of the town. So that's something we'll talk about in a few weeks when I bring that forward. But for now, we're not going to be able to collect these taxes. We need to get them written off the books. Linda, real quick, um, you said that the owner of the park was able to liquidate one of the uh, trailers or mobile homes, excuse me. Um, so what's the pecking order for reimbursement? You said there wasn't enough for him to cover his cost, but I know that there's pecking yes. orders for when there's a lien or there's back taxes. I always thought the town was at the, the top of the heap for collecting. In most cases, it would be that way, but in the case of a mobile home park, I mean, really, he could have he could have dropped them at town hall and just left them with us. But he had ten thousand dollars, I believe, in back lot rent that he didn't get to collect. Okay. And he only made thirty three hundred dollars on the two mobile homes. How does he get rid of them? Uh, he's he's selling them oh. for what he can get. Oh. Thirty three hundred for the two of them. Is that discussion something that Donna will, should be involved in? I have invited Donna to be part of the discussion when we bring this forward. I originally planned to do it on May fifth, but our attorney, I want her to be available too that night, and she's not going to be available. So this is going to come to you on the twenty first of May uh, to discuss all of those foreclosed properties that we now have. Nineteenth. Nineteenth. What did I say? Twenty-first. I'm sorry. <laughs> Be the 19th. Yes, the nineteenth. Uh, will we approve abatement of uncollectible taxes for lot seventeen and lot thirty B at West Village Mobile Home Park? Second. It's a motion by Harold. A second by Mike to uh, approve the abatement of those of the taxes for those two uh, properties. All those in favor. Thank you. Thank well, next you. is warrant number 23. That's a short list this evening. Checks over $1,000. Bernstein, sure, Sawyer, and Nelson. This is our monthly retainer and a little bit extra for a question that I had to ask our tip attorney. $1,157.16. Blue Rock Earthworks. This is for uh, demo removal and recycling. $4,357.66. Main equalization, this is our monthly assessing contract fee, $2,287.50. Uh, 
Main waste to energy, this is solid waste services, $4,439.07. Runyon, Kirsten, Willette, uh, this is the final bill for the audit, uh, which ends last June of um, 2020, which will be coming to you at your next meeting for approval, uh, $4,500. State YMCA Camp of Maine, Johnson Control installed a, they were required to have a monitoring system in there because they had the children there. Knowing that we were going to be keeping that administration building, it was worth putting that installation in there for the future. That's $5,319. Treasurer State of Maine, uh, this is motor vehicle, licenses, plates, titles, $13,041.17. Treasurer State of Maine uh, for Moses for um, motor vehicle, uh, not motor vehicle, uh, registration for ATVs and recreational uh, boats and fishing and hunting, $11,149.06. And Wright Pierce for engineering services on Wilson Pond Culvert, $5,006.06. Uh, so Tim has made a motion, Harold the second to approve the warrant number 23. All those in favor? Thank you. And next is a work session on, uh, uh, on hybrid inspections and in-house third party inspectors. I brought this forward uh, in talking to Daniel, who is here this evening and will take over for me. Just briefly, um, when we first started um, hiring a new code enforcement officer, I talked to most of you, talked to a lot of people in the community, and, and the consensus was it should be a part-time position, which made sense to me. Uh, but we also were getting a lot of feedback from some of you, some people in the public saying that we really should go to a third party inspector system where uh, the code enforcement officer is not the person doing the inspections of the building permits, but a third party inspector is doing that. Recognizing that third party inspectors uh, could be charging more, we uh, brought this back to you to drop our fees um, for when it was a third party inspection but leave the fees alone when it was Daniel. The hope was that uh, with Daniel being part-time that people were going to go to third-party inspectors. These are certified inspectors that the state certifies and they would be using them. We're finding, however, that people want Daniel to do their inspections. And we're running into an issue with people coming into the building, expecting Daniel to be there on Mondays and Wednesdays when he's posted on the website that he will be in but he's out doing inspections and people get frustrated and upset by that because sometimes they take time off to come in. They have questions about their building permit application and Daniel needs to be there to help walk them through it and get them to that point. Daniel does a really good job of explaining to people what their options are, either having him or going with a third party. I think in some cases he tries to encourage the third party inspections because the third party inspectors are certified by the state. Um, but that's not the way it's going. So bring this back to you. I remember when I brought this to you, the suggestion was to go with a hybrid system and offer it this way, but no community in the state that does this, I've talked to other managers and no community in the state that has third party inspector system has a hybrid system. It's not an either or, it's one way or the other. So um, I think we're recommending to you that um, we rethink this and go strictly to a third party inspector system, but I will let Dan speak to that. Hi, everybody. It's good to actually meet you guys in person. I think this is the first time ever. Um, so just some background would be that since we started to do this, I've given out probably 23 of the building permits, and of those 23, five have, have chosen to do the the third party inspections, which is about 20% rate. So it's not very high. Um, a lot, essentially what happens when somebody comes in for a permit, I say, you know, so, you know, after we get the whole thing, I mean, after they've shown you what, what they have and, and, and I tell them that it, it, it's approved and so on. And then say, okay, so now we have some options for the inspections. And I lay it out as plainly as I can. And generally the answer that I get is, oh, I'll just have you do it. So they don't even take time. I don't think they're comprehending, comprehending 
love what I'm saying, or maybe they don't care, but it's, you know, I, 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 either way, the, the big thing is that it's taking a lot of time for me to be out of the office to do, to do, to do all, to do all these inspections too. <clears throat> I think one thing that we should consider is that I'm learning the codes, the, not the town codes, the town codes aren't that hard, but the movie codes, I'm learning them as quickly as I can. And I know them pretty well now, but I think that it could be putting the, the, the town as a liability too, because if you have a third party inspector doing it, then it takes all the liability of, of the inspection off from the town and, and then puts it on to that third party inspector. Again, if we stay, you know, if we have me do all the inspections, I'm learning them as quickly as I can. And I, I've actually caught a few things here and there. So it's not like I don't know what I'm talking about when I go up for them. But, and as far as the, the, the revenue goes, I think the report that I gave you this, this, for this meeting, it does show that there is a slight bit of, 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 of a difference in the fees, but we haven't really lost a lot compared to where we were this time, yeah, yeah like last year. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. I would be more happy to answer any questions. Well, a couple of quick ones. Sure. The first line on your report there said it was a $150,000 job, but the fee was only $109.50. Right, that was a third party one. So that one was a third party one. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. My, my only concern about the rest of this is my thoughts and my concerns initially were I wanted the residents of the town to be able to use the least expensive option for them. All right. Uh, on a lower cost project, like changing a window that might change a, the header, which is a structural component. Uh, that job might cost less than a thousand dollars. So the permit's going to be 25 bucks. Okay. And normally the code inspector for the town would go out and take a quick look and say, Yeah, you did the right, did it the right way, good. All right. Now it's still going to cost them $25 for the permit, but it's going to cost them a hundred dollars for someone from a third party to come out and inspect. My intention originally was below a certain amount, it would be the town inspected. Above a certain amount, third party would do it because uh, above a certain amount, it would be cheaper for the third party to do it with the fee structure that we had. Um, the only thing I can say is, should uh, we elect to go all third party, and I, I don't have a problem with it if that's what the board wants to do, we need to look at that lower end fee structure and maybe uh, say it needs to be $25 up to a certain amount or something uh, more than it used to be. Because now it's $25. Oh, what the heck was it? Well, it was $25 for 3,000 and a dollar a thousand afterwards under the old fee structure. And the new fee structure was what? Uh, 10 cents a square foot, minimum $25. So- It's $5 per thousand. Oh, that's right, $5 per thousand, thank you. I, I knew that. I misspoke, I guess. But in any event, I, I would like to see us or have you look at this and, and uh, give us an idea of how we might adjust the fee structure on the lower end to, to help some of those people, uh, you know, who are expecting a $25 fee and now they've got a $125 fee. And I just, you know, I think that would be... Uh, um, kind of hard on some people. My only input is I've never had to apply for a building permit and I just did and worked with my contractor and had all my paperwork printed out from the website, filled out and got all my information from my contractor and went up there with it. And I already had spoken to my contractor and said, do you have a third party you want to work with? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, that's yeah. what I'd like to do too. And so, but people, whenever there's change, there's resistance to change. <laughs> and um, if we say you need to have a third party, I mean, if they're 
doing an addition like I'm doing. I'm sure Daniel doesn't want to be down there at every um, stroke of the hour doing something. And, you know, I think that we need to make it black and white. It can't be this middle of the road, mm. you know, thing that takes Daniel out of the office so that it's interrupting what people are doing. So it is not that hard to do the paperwork and have it done. And people can always call and say, how do I do this? Which actually I did. I talked to Ernie and because I spoke to Ernie because I know him personally. Mm. And Ernie helped me make sure that I had my ducks in a row before I went up there. Plus I worked with my contractor. So if you're working with a contractor, this is something well, a contractor a, does all the time. That, that's a very good point. It really is. And you really need to make sure you talk to your contractor and come up with a plan because contractors do it all yeah, the exactly. time. And they have third-party people they know they want to work with or third-party people they don't want to work with. And I had already pulled a list, which I forwarded to Linda of the Kennebec County and Androscoggin County uh, third-party inspectors. And, and so that list is available and they were right there on it. So mm -hmm. you can get their email addresses and get in touch with them. So, um, you know, to keep Daniel in the office, I think that we need to, to make a decision about that. And yes, if it is a third party and it's only a window replacement, then maybe we need to figure out tweaking those that, that's the, my, yeah, that's those, my point. those little numbers for for little things like that. But um, so I'm just I'm just concerned that if we go 100 percent third party and we don't have an option for extremely small projects like a window like replacing a 3-0 door with a 3-6 door or, or whatever that, that technically requires a permit, but the person's going to do it themselves. And so they get the cost of the window or the door or whatever else it is. Um, and then they're going to pay half as much for a third-party inspection as they are for the component that they just bought to get installed. They're just not going to get a permit. Yeah, I wouldn't. When we move forward with this, one of the things that came up, and I remember talking with Linda, I want to make sure that people in this town don't end into the position where they're paying more when it's all said and done. And for these smaller ones, um, but this clearly has slipped under the radar. But I, I don't think we should walk away from that. I think we've got to come up with some threshold while well, well, we're leading this whole thing out. And Daniel, at some point, is going to have to do some of those smaller ones. They don't want, you know, it's like Linda, we, we came up with a spreadsheet of, where those costs were for the third party inspectors and they are, they're all over the board. But you can go in and see what those, those costs are going to be. But in any event, to come in and do, uh, for the example, that Harold threw out with the door, um, I, I think you, you we're putting, I, I mean, I, I think our customer service um, went, went into the hole if that's good, what's going to happen for people with really small projects. Mm -hmm. and, if we have to adjust his hours or make it a little bit more flexible to get some of those things done, we might have to really look at it. And I think that these are single inspection projects where this exactly. you, you are placing the window or replacing a door. Right. It's a small value. We set a number value on it. You can't exceed this amount. You can't exceed more than one inspection. So if someone has a project that's going to require more than one inspection, it's going to be third party. Yeah. But something that's a small number value, it's going to be one inspection. Then I don't see if we've only issued 23 permits, um, how many of those would have fallen under that criteria? In the small? Yeah. Not many. There's been a couple like people that have just been like with a deck on their house and a deck. You kind of could just be, you just go inspect, oh, great. Okay, you didn't put it into the ground or you didn't do this. Right. Yeah, you, you make sure it meets code. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, so that's that's why if we've only had like two or three of those out of the 23, then I don't see any reason why we couldn't set that threshold that no more than one inspection required, no more than X dollar value will be uh, available for the code uh, enforcement officer to, to inspect anything above one inspection required and above a certain dollar value. Um, requires third party inspection. I would be open to that. Yeah. And, and there's, a, there's, some tripping, there's some tripping points with, with that too, because when you're going through, say, a, a fairly large project like Kristen's doing, for example, she's got to have a core inspection. So 
before they come over and pour the cement, um, the CEO is supposed to go over. Well, yeah. that's one of the ones that if you only, you know, 16 hours a week, right. and you got cement trucks on site, you're like, where's, you know, the hitch? Just, that even happened when Dave was working full time. Yeah. So getting that third party person that's in for all the steps, hey, we're going to be pouring on Wednesday. We need to have you over there by Tuesday at the latest. Um, I don't. I just can't see Daniel being able to fulfill that. I mean, I think people need to understand that going in. Um, third third party inspector is yes. going to be their best option for large projects. But for the little stuff, yeah. I agree with Harold. It's, it sounds like it's going to be manageable for you. So, and that's mainly what I tell people too. Is yeah. You know, I say, hey, I'm only available two days a week. So if you need to have, and they say, oh, well, I don't care when that happens. Uh, well, they will when the concrete yeah, trucks on site. Yeah, when, so. they're back in a cement, <laughs> when they're back in a cement truck in, it's like you can't pour because it hasn't been inspected. That's a problem. I think that all these little like, nuances that we've that we've been discussing talking about are the exact reason why we need to have to have the CEO do all of them or or to 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 or to go to third party. Because we literally can make ourselves go crazy trying to think of all of the, the Nuances. Well, I don't think there's any nuances in one inspection. You know, a, pro a, a small project under a certain dollar value, say a thousand dollars, and it required one inspection. You should be able to do that. There's only been a couple of them, right? You said anything above that, your project requires one one inspection, right? Okay, your project's out. You don't have to do it more than one inspection. Right. It's more than a thousand dollars, right? Well, the other the other thing is the other thing is sixteen hours a week. You post your hours, you're in the office on those hours, and you say four hours on Wednesday afternoon or whatever it is I'm inspecting will not be in the office. That goes on the website. Shouldn't be confusing at all. Well, my, and I understand what you're saying, Tim, but the problem is, you know, when people, especially if there's a contractor involved, they want the inspector to be there when they're there. So Danny wouldn't have any idea. He could set four hours aside or two hours or whatever. But then somebody's still going to call him and need him at a different time. We deal with contractors all the time, and they want the code enforcement officer there when they're there. That's the beauty of a third party inspector. But the other thing I just want to reinforce that he's not just a building oh, inspector, he is also the code enforcement officer. And we have people calling us on a regular basis complaining about violations of the code. Um, people who have, you know, either built buildings too close or put fences up that are unsightly, or it's a junkyard across from my house. So those are things that he all, he does have to go out and inspect those things. So that's more time out of the office. And I think well, with the new court officer, there's going to be more of those anyway. People are thinking, oh, you know, <laughs> the, new, the new guy now. We can try to see the point. Now. I still, so given the fact that we just just heard that there's only a couple of those small projects, I still don't see why we can't. Uh, uh, avail our residents of a very low cost, very easy option for a single inspection project under a thousand dollars. Is there any way to adjust the fee? I mean, obviously it's only $25, but I mean, what is the minimum fee that can be charged for a project like that? Or, you know, that's up to the board. Yeah. You set the fees. Well, uh, and I think the minimum of 25 is good because if he has to go out to uh, wherever, wherever in town he has to go to do a single inspection for a small project, it's going to cost at least $25 for him to go do that. Time and mileage. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, and if we if we go this route with the, the cap, can we have a revisit? in a few months to see how it's worked out. I mean, I we're coming like, into, yeah. I think oh, that I we need perfectly. to yeah. come back and revisit it to see how it's working for Daniel yep. and how it's working for people and then see in if time, there yeah. needs to be an adjustment um, yes. to that. So right. Because we're visit. also coming into a busier time Absolutely. here where people are yeah. gonna be doing a lot more, but I think that we need to make it crystal clear that I there's think, a cap. And I think we got to, and I, I agree with Harold's threshold, but I don't know if a thousand dollars is enough because a sheet of OSB is usually like four bucks and it's $35. Oh, yeah. 
So a thousand dollars, you know, you know, you can't do any. I don't know. You can't do anything. A chicken coop is more than a thousand dollars now. So you want to just say one inspection if it requires if it, more than one inspection. I think that sounds good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Okay. I can look at the code more because. If we really wanted, I mean, if we really did everything by the books, then all things would take more than one inspection. So if somebody were to, to just put a deck on, say, technically, if we follow the letter of the code, I should go inspect when they dig the hole for the post. I should go inspect when they the footing. when they put the footing in. If they're going to put it in, in cement, I should go back to inspect it when they when they build the forms. I'm sorry, not the forms, but you, you, you so sorry. You don't have to go before they put a window in. Okay. Right? Right. Um, no. So you don't have to go before just, they put in a different yeah, door. Exactly. So if it ended up being like if it was a deck that required multiple inspections by the law, that's going to take it right out of your right. hands because there's no deck out there that's going to cost you under a thousand dollars right now. Right. Um, and uh, but it'd be a lot more than that. Exactly. Yeah, and and uh, so if it was only the door window things, you know, that were simple one inspection. So we have to put that caveat in there if it's one inspection. So one inspection, we'll no dollar amount attached. One inspection, no dollar amount. That way it will encourage people, people to get to, the yeah. permit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Because I can tell you right now, if you don't do that and somebody's going to have to pay half of what it's going to cost them to do this project for himself because it's a small project that is not going to get a permit. We'll come back and revisit yeah. this in a few months. Yeah. See how it's going. Yeah. We'll give it. Well, and I, I, I'll yeah. say too, I mean, um, you think about this for a couple of weeks. If you have uh, some other information you'd like to tell us at the next board meeting, you know, or say, well, we think this is okay, but this part isn't. We think we didn't think about this, whatnot. That's fine. Also, Linda, I think as this, this um, the town website has this thing evolves, I, I, um, I'm just checking it as we're talking and going to code enforcement. It's like, there's nothing popping up for process and, and that kind of thing. The building permit has the process. It does. So I'm going, again, I'm just trying this thing out as we're going down to office and I go to code enforcement. And it doesn't code enforcement, the whole thing pops open. Because I had to ask where it was when and I did it. And then it goes to ordinance. So. No, don't go to ordinance. Well, I don't tap on the code. Don't tap on the pop out. Just click on the words code. And they don't make that clear, but that's that's the way it works. That's, I think that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, yeah. I understand yeah. exactly what you're saying. Yeah. 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 But and the actual building permit itself explains the whole process. Did, yeah. we get, uh, did we get the third party inspector list yet? Uh, we created a we, I say Daniel, uh, created a third party inspector list for Kennebec County. Yep. Uh, uh, the, so this has been a challenge as well because it used to be handled, <laughs> used to be handled under the uh, Department of Economic and Community Development and it flipped over to the state fire marshal's office. I called the fire marshal's office. I said, where is the link to your list? They never returned my call. So I reached out to my contact, Dan Roy, and I said, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you talk to the fire uh, marshal and see if we can get the link. So Dan got the link for me, but when you get the link and we put it up and we thought we were great, you have to go in and you have to put, you know, what division you're looking in. And it the average very, person very doesn't know that. Confusing. So well, we, we dumped that, eventually. we dumped that link today and uh, Daniel created a list of third party inspectors, just Kennebec County. And well, we, I, would, I would also include the Androscoggin yeah, because absolutely. there's even more in Androscoggin and Androscoggin is only right there. Yeah, you know? yeah. 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 So I would put Androscoggin on there because there's even more for Androscoggin if my memory served me right, right with that yeah, link. Well. So I would put Androscoggin in there because right. people can come from Lewiston just as easily, and there was a guy in green that I actually knew his name too. So yeah. there's there's quite a few. Yeah. Well, I would, that's I that's would that's also that's include that's 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 It would have been much easier if we had a link, but the fire marshal's office is not maintaining a link, is not maintaining a list anymore because they're finding that the list changes so frequently yeah. with people being added, and I guess some people going off. Yeah. That they can't maintain it, so they said we're not doing the list anymore. So I'm like, okay. Well, luckily well, I found that one because I had just the, that we have what? 
They have funds to maintain that. That's yeah. that's just outrageous that they would they would. Unbelievable. <laughs> well, the database that was a surprise. Well, I looked and looked and looked. What was that? The database. Yeah. And I tried to figure it out. So I called them. Well, they talked to me and said, "Hey, you know, how come? Yeah. Why doesn't the database work?" And they essentially so they may seem like I as the CEO. Um, um, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like the first person that, that has ever called them. <laughs> I'm like, I'm pretty sure that the long CEO didn't tell you about it. But I did ask her to print me off a list, and that's yeah. when we found out that they don't make a list anymore. Yeah. yeah. So, e so even if you manage to get through all the all the all of the drop downs and everything, the database it still works. Yeah. Anyway. The, the fire marshal's office has a slush fund for that, and I, I have no idea how they're managing it. Rich McCarthy is the person you want to talk to. I left a message for him, yeah. he never called me back. <laughs> but Dan has a connection to the fire marshal's office, so I figured I'd go that route, and that's how we ended up with the next link, but that didn't work either. So. We'll add to this list. Uh, and and I, Andrew Scoggin on there. So we will try yeah. one um, one inspection only. Daniel does it. Anything over one inspection goes to third party. Yeah. Excellent. And we and will report back to you in a few few months. Or as Tim said, if we think of something that we didn't think of tonight, we'll bring it back to you. Thank I you. mean, I, I have no problem with Dan or you bringing it back anytime on any subject. Okay, that's what we're here for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Thanks Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> 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 See you. Thank you. Drive right, careful. Thank you. Uh, next is the RSU2 budget impact on mama. Before we get into that a little bit, I wanted to just tell everybody what little bit I know about the Kennebec County budget. I should be getting my budget package in the mail next week. They haven't, the, the county commissioners haven't fully finished with the budget. I do know that last year, because of uh, the state police abandoning essentially rural uh, policing, they no longer will do rural patrols anywhere, uh, that all the counties were scrambling to fit that into their budgets. Well, they wanted to, to add two full-time officers to the sheriff's department. What they ended up doing, uh, because we all kind of rebelled, uh, was to um, add one uh, full-time officer six months through the budget. So this year, that officer is going to have to go the whole year, and they're probably going to want to add another officer six months through the budget. So that's going to be an increase to all the towns. I know that costs are up at the county jail. The, the um, legislature did not significantly change their funding. And I know other uh, costs at the courthouse and other things will be up a little bit too. So I expect there to be a somewhat hefty increase in the uh, county budget. Uh, and a hefty increase for them, of course, is you know, eight or nine percent uh, reflects upon us about fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. It's not the same as the school budget, which we're going to discuss now. And I will tell you what I think about that school budget. Well, can I uh, oh, go ahead, Doug. Comment about like, what you just said. What, so, what is the state police doing if they're not doing uh, rural patrol? I couldn't get a satisfactory answer out of that because that doesn't that doesn't come into the county budget anyway. Uh, you know, I mean that that's a state thing, and I, I the only thing that I think that they said, as I recall, was there's some pressure on personnel staffing. Uh, and, and they're having trouble filling some positions at the state level in the state police department. But I think that was the only thing that was said by the, the, the sheriff's, uh, the sheriff when he came to explain it to us. Okay. Okay, now if I might just so, mention okay. about the school budget in school. It is a 1.1 mil increase to us. Someone with a $200,000 house after tax exemptions are going to be, you know, homestead exemptions, that's going to be a $220 increase. Uh, somebody else just brought it up to me because I've been getting quite a few calls about it. They said they live on the lake. They pay $9,000 a year. 
Well, their tax increase is going to be six hundred and fifty dollars. So you know, someone with a hundred thousand dollar property is going to be a hundred twenty dollar increase. My father-in-law falls into that category, uh, and he's on a fixed income. He's over ninety. His Social Security is all he has. So my big concern, of course, and I brought those up, was how are we going to fund our own things in the town? How are we going to maintain roads? How are we going to fix our equipment, keep our equipment? And of course, the, the board said, well, that's not their concern. And I understand that that's not their concern. I, but I think it's irresponsible for them to expect that we're going to cut our budgets and not give the people of the town the services that they want to have to fund these huge increases. And I will also say that uh, a number of years ago, I think it was 2018, uh, I asked the town manager at that time to give me a, a breakdown of for 10 years of what the taxes increases were what we paid the county each year, what we paid the school each year, what the town's budget each year was. And in that 10 year period, the taxes on the average house went up about $1,000, okay? $50, only $50 was from the town budget. The town was very responsible, still kept up, you know, as best as the roads, the equipment, the other things, all right? The county went up $150, policing in the jail. So jail was a major driver at that time. School went up $800, $800 increase in your tax bill was from the school. My concern is we go up every year of one mill. A few years we're at 25 mills. That's pretty expensive for a small town that with a small downtown. I mean, I was recently in Maryland. My daughter bought a new house down there. We went down to visit my little granddaughter. She just turned one on Friday. And her house cost 429,000 because housing prices are a little higher down there. But they've got water, sewer, sidewalks, around the corners, a brand new school, around the other corners, a brand new fire station. They're five minutes from the mall, they're five minutes from the country, beautiful area, nice cul-de-sac organized neighborhood, her taxes are $6,000 a year. We've got a house from a constituent who called me on the street on, on the other side of town, brand new house, it's valued at $329,000 uh, after his exemptions. His taxes are $6,000 a year. He doesn't have sidewalks, he doesn't have water, he doesn't have sewer. He's miles from anything. I. I, I just think that we as a board need to say something about this. My father sat on the school board for, I think it was either 12 or 15 years and never would have come out of his mouth that he was not responsible to the town. He would never have said that because he, is, he was responsible to the taxpayers that elected him. And he was always, mindful of that. And if these increases continue, as you said, we will price ourselves out of anything, <laughs> you know, and, and how can anybody that wants to live in this town afford to live here? So I was, I was really upset that that was said. And I was really upset that it was made everybody made it crystal clear that is there a plan b and from my understanding a plan, plan plan b was never even discussed it was just a unanimous vote yes for plan a <laughs> because <laughs> because they figure they can put forth any increase and it's going to pass well i hope it doesn't pass because there has to be some line drawn in the sand and um as I said that night, you know, if they want to call it a corporation, then you have to um, run it like a corporation. And if your costs are exceeding your revenues, then something's got to give somewhere. 
you know, nobody is ever going to spend more than they can take in because that is a collapse. Unless you're the government. And, and well, exactly. And you can print money in the basement, but yeah. obviously we're not doing that right now. We get in trouble with credit. Money. Well, exactly. So, um, you know, and I said that night, it's not a bottomless well. There has to be an end in sight. And, um, you know, I, I firmly believe in, in self-government um, and having a say-so that doesn't involve five other or whatever it is. Four other entities, you know, because Monmouth very well may vote the budget down, or Richmond may vote it down because they're thinking they're on the way out. But if it's not a majority, uh, actually, it's not a majority of towns. Well, it's got to be a majority. It's fifty percent of the people it, that vote. So, but so. So Monmouth, if enough people in Monmouth voted, theoretically, we could scuttle the budget. So, you know, that, that, that's the, the biggest thing. And, um, you know, when you ask questions and you don't get answers, um, that always kind of concerns me. <laughs> I'm right so, there with you on that one. Um, I, I think that we've worked hard to make ourselves um, transparent. Um, I think we're always open to answering questions from people. And uh, that's been my goal is to make sure that not only the select board, but the other committees are transparent and the information's there, but I'm not feeling that same thing with the RSU. So that's my two cents. <laughs> well, I, I did talk to a member of the board and the last Zoom meeting, I have trouble. I catch it, sometimes it breaks up. You know, what we were really trying to determine is what, what's the main driver in this 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 four hundred and ninety two thousand dollar increase, and what was explained and part of what I caught during the meeting, but the person reemphasized with it is that the the increase is all based on fixed costs for labor agreements, and there's been several other things that have come up that um, I believe um, for for a point of discussion that might fall into the realm of unfunded mandates because apparently the state is saying that all teachers, their base salary has to start at a minimum of $40,000 per year. So I think that with the teachers leaving the higher end, you know, there's still that coming into pay, coming into play. Um, but that is, I mean, one, after 3%, generally people are screaming for, you know, for an annual increase. But when you're looking at nearly 10%, um, I, I'd be surprised if this thing was was approved, but that's what the explanation was: fixed cost. Well, another part of the explanation too is last year they had a one point two five million dollar surplus. Okay, they've taken to calling it unfunded, un unfunded balance, whatever. Okay, it was a surplus. They had a they 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 had appropriated or, or raised one point two five million dollars more. Than they needed, right? And so last year they took five hundred thousand dollars of that, put it towards the budget. They took it out of that the bank, so to speak, and made the uh, increase much less to everyone. So so we had a pretty good year. Uh, basically, they want that five hundred thousand dollars back this year. And one of the, when I asked about it, the explanation I got is because they got to pay summer salaries. Well, I thought we still paid every other week, even through the summer. Don't we? Yeah. Yeah. It's spread out. Our payments are spread out. So they have income coming in over the summer. Uh, don't everybody, uh, the teachers. And, uh, You're right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, I'm not buying it, I guess, is what I'm saying. I'm not buying it. But, you know, when they talked about the, uh, um, insurance is not being able to change that. And there, if you've got a negotiated contract for health insurance, but it's but beyond other there's other insurances that you can negotiate and put out to bid, and that's facilities and and uh, vehicles and you know that type of thing, other types of insurance that are available out there that can be put up to bid that you can look at and have you know because that was another one of the line items that was large, the percentage increase mm -hmm. in in insurances, but. You know, it's one thing for help if it's a negotiated, but 
that can be looked at in future contracts, but you can also look at you know other types of insurances. But well, there was also mention made of, of the fact that you know those contracts are in place. And, I mean, I think Harold had talked about the openers and that kind of thing. So no, you can't do that. I have yet to see a community contract that does not have a force majeure clause in it that says you can't reopen this thing because of COVID, you know, and that's where we're at right now. Um, I don't think it's going to do anybody any good to start beating up on, on the teachers, but um, that statement alone maybe got me thinking that you're not looking at what our options are in entirety. You're, you're making this claim and that claim is not accurate. Well, I don't think we I don't think our intention should be to beat up on anybody. Exactly. I think our intention should be to look out, just as they, they stated their intentions, was to look out for the, the children and their budget. Well, our intention should be to look out for the citizens of Monmouth and our budget. Yes. And I think it would behoove this board to make a recommendation on yes or no vote on the school budget. That's what I think we should do. And as as, and as as I don't know if everybody knows it on this board, but we cannot initiate a withdrawal. Okay, it has to be done by a separate committee uh, that is formed, and they have to research it and, and then bring the results back to us. So we've been through this before one time, and when the voting happened, uh, it was actually about sixty four or five percent that of the voters who voted, who wanted to get out. Unfortunately, there's also a state threshold for the number of people that have to vote in that withdrawal. And we were 14 votes shy yes. of that threshold, I think. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Might have been a little more, might have been a little less. I can't remember exactly. And if, if you have Richmond and Dresden that pull out of this thing, the, uh, the impact, I don't even know how to look at that. I think 10% would be a drop in the bucket if all of a sudden, you know, that, how that whole process. Yeah, I don't know, because uh, yeah. you, you'd also lose all the expense associated yeah, with it. So that, that would be, that would be one of those things that would have to be, they'd have to, that's, that's hard to get. They'd out. have to look hard at to it when it actually, if it actually faced with it, then they'd, they'd have to look at all the expenses they incur, all the, all the expenses, what would be left over and then what that total expense would be and how it would get divided out over the, the three the towns that would be left. Well, well and, and that's a good point here, but at the, and, and I just real quick, it's, it's like well, how the bonding structure is based. You know, if you've got five towns in that and you just, you know, we built a school, aren't those five towns, are we all working in that yes. part together? I don't understand that enough to, to really- The RSU bonded the, the money, so it's whatever's left of the R, as long as the RSU is in existence, they're responsible for that. Not the individual towns. And actually, that gets reimbursed by the state every year for a new school. Yeah, what right. it doesn't get reimbursed is the bond that the RSU floated to do the improvements at the Richmond schools. That gets charged out across the RSU to each town. And that's in the budget there somewhere. But that, the, the, that only other, thing is true. the only other thing I'd just like to mention for everybody to keep in mind is that. Um, Part of this issue is the fact that this, the state's uh, funding formula for education, I think, is has got some very serious flaws in it. One of them is that a large portion of the funding is based on a, a, a student uh, ratio. So it's, uh, we'll just say for the average, because it's, I think, 7,500 for uh, K through 8 and 7,900 for Nine through twelve, or something like that. I don't remember exactly. What well, that's the the, is. that's what the state pays. I understand that, yeah. Tim. So we what I'm saying rest. is, well, my point is that the census goes down, like ninety three, I think, is what they said fell off. That equates to seven hundred thousand dollars that they're not going to get. They may get money elsewhere for other things, so the the total amount of funding from the state may. Be at the same level, it might even go up a little bit, but it would have been up even more if they hadn't lost the money from the, the student enrollment going down. So that doesn't, on the state side, that doesn't take into account the fixed expense that has to be, um, that isn't associated with a drop in student enrollment. Because 
the state's looking at student enrollment as if that that equates to the expense and it doesn't because classes can't be dropped if you go through the RSU if you go from uh, uh, a class size of 23 through the RSU to an average class size of, of uh, 19 doesn't mean you can drop a, a teacher a position or a class so there are funding flaws in the formula that the state uses that we should be asking our representatives in the legislature to look at addressing. Exactly what you said was one of the um, points made to mm -hmm. the discussion I had today was you have some classes in Dresden, they have nine, nine kids. We do get a half a teacher. This doesn't work like that. Exactly. So, That's exactly um, right. Yeah, there's a lot of dynamics that play with this thing. Um, but we're not going to solve them tonight. No. Nope. <laughs> so I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Oh, oh. It that way, because I had to wipe up my water that all came into the low spot with beer where I still have water. <laughs> yes, Dennis has the heat yeah, finally, yeah. so it starts to cool off fast. It's a sweetheart. <laughs>